Hi, everybody watching and listening on Super Soul. I'm here with Jamie Kern Lima, the co founder of It Cosmetics. And let me tell you, Jamie has an incredible story. If you haven't heard it already, she started It Cosmetics in her living room with her husband, Paulo, and eventually sold it to L'Oreal for $1.2 billion. That's the B, the B word. And she's been on the Forbes list of America's wealthiest self made women for six years now, and um, happens to be my neighbor, literally across the fence neighbor. Uh, hello, neighbor. Hello. A New York Times bestselling author. You like, like that title too? Very grateful. For her first uh, book, Believe It, How to Go from Underestimated to Unstoppable. And I have to say, she's written a new book that I think is going to take the world by storm because it is exactly what I know so many people, particularly women people need. Worthy, worthy. How to believe you are enough and transform your life. I have to tell you, I think this is a, a dynamite title that so expresses what is within the content. So you have the content to actually match the title. And I cannot tell you, that one of the reasons why, when I first heard you were doing this book, I was so excited, Jamie, because as you know, I have all these beautiful, intelligent, brilliant, bright daughter girls at my school in South Africa. Many of them have come to the United States. And I will tell you that the number one issue with these girls who have IQ levels off the chart, who have come through the most terrible times, each of them has an average of six uh, adverse childhood experiences that they have when they've come to my school. They have overcome the worst. And the number one issue that girls still suffer from is a sense of worthiness, being able to claim the opportunities and gifts that they have been given. So you writing this book, I'm excited for this conversation. Is that why you wrote the book? Because you could sense that it was so needed? Yeah, I wrote Worthy for every single girl and woman who's ever doubted their enough or doubted their worthiness or is like tired of what self-doubts already costs them. You're not leaving guys out either, but nope. you, you're mostly <laughs> thinking about you, you, you had a, a woman-centered uh, ideal when you were writing the book. I did. And it's just, I feel exactly what you've shared. And I see that in my own life as mm -hmm. well. And you know, the intention of the book is to help every single person feel left, less alone and, and more enough and to really give them tools to build, mm -hmm. you know, true self-worth. And Oprah, the, um, there's a series of, of powerful moments that happened in my life that had me reflect on like, what is self-doubt mm -hmm. already cost me in my life? And one of them, um, which the answer is way too much. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of them was the first time I ever heard you say these words. You said, in life, you do not become what you want. You become what you believe you're worthy of. And when you said that, it was like my soul like shifted. And it had me thinking about every single moment in my life where I was stuck or I sabotaged something and they never went for it and I didn't know why. And I realized, oh, wow, it's because deep down inside. You didn't believe you were worthy. I didn't believe I was worthy. And even the stuff in the press, Oprah, like the most victorious moments the press celebrates in my life, like mm. what I know is they almost didn't happen because deep down inside, I was struggling to believe I was worthy of them. So I wrote this book for every girl, every woman, every person who has some self-doubt to destroy and a destiny to fulfill. Um, it is a real, a real thing. I used to feel alone in it, and now I realize I'm not. Well, here is what I think is the essence of your message with this book. And anyone watching or listening to us, I'm telling you, the book is filled with gems like this one. In life, you don't soar to the level of your hopes and dreams. Mm -hmm. You stay stuck at the level of your self-worth. You don't rise to what you believe is possible. You fall to what you believe you're worthy of. I think that idea is so huge. It's, it's what I've been saying for years. When you change what you believe you are worthy of, you change your entire life is what you say. Yes, yes. And it's every area of your life, our, our friendships and what we think That's we're right. worthy of and, and friendships and, and our, relationships and how yes. you're treated in those relationships. Yes. yes. And, 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 you know, imposter syndrome when it comes to your own ambitions and putting your talents out in the world. And it is 
wild to me that I used to think I was alone in this. And, and what I know right now is we're speaking, like studies show 80% of women feel that they're not enough. 75% of uh, female executives have dealt with imposter syndrome and 91% of women don't love their bodies. That mm. is a lot of girls and women dealing with this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, self-worth is really the one thing that can change everything. And the most beautiful thing that I'm most excited about is that it's never too late to build it. Like you're never too young or, or too That's old, right. you know, to, to unlearn the, yeah. the lies it's that lead to self-doubt. And never too young. So you can give this to any child in your family who can read yeah. and never too old because you can start right now today where you are. I love when you say in the very beginning of the book, you say, I believe one of the most prevalent forms of cancel culture mm -hmm. is one that no one talks about. It's us canceling ourselves before we even try. Mm -hmm. That's so yes. huge. Yes. So many people are like, why am I stuck? Why am I not going for the thing? Why? And we cancel ourselves before we even try. It is a huge thing. And, you know, when we so many times we'll accomplish things, we'll achieve things, we'll think that that will make it better, but those things only build self-confidence. And mm -hmm. when we don't have underlying strong self-worth, which is different, low self-worth can sabotage us in uh, three big ways. And one of them is we stay stuck because we doubt we're, we're worthy of actually going for it, or we doubt we're worthy of our ideas or of sharing them with the world. So, so you say it is imperative that we learn to distinguish, this is what I so loved in the book, that you were able to draw the lines literally so we can look at the graph and see and distinguish the difference between self-confidence, which I want you to define for us and talk about, and self-worth. Please explain that. I thought, ah, big aha there. Big aha, life-changing. Um, yes. Okay. For everyone that has ever accomplished that thing and thought it would bring in fulfillment or thought it would make them feel enough, and then they finally accomplish that thing, and then you, you know, you're happy or fulfilled for a second, and then you're like, wait a minute, I still feel like something's missing. I still feel like I don't have enough. So then you keep trying. Or you want the next thing and then the, the next, next thing. thing. And the next thing. And and by the way, this could be, I, I, I want that big job title or I want this number in my bank account or the six pack abs or the health goal or the, the white picket fence. Then you get the thing, you think it will make you happy. And, and, and that thing only helped you build confidence, but it didn't help you build self-worth, which is different. So Self-worth is the, you know, is knowing innately that you are innately worthy of love and belonging, that you are valuable exactly as you are, yeah. not as you achieve, not as the, the amount the world celebrates you or doesn't, not as you've accomplished your own definition of success, but exactly as you are right now. I am worthy because I am. Yes, yes. I am worthy because I, I am. I am worthy because I am. Because I was born, because that egg and that sperm hit, and I got to come to the planet Earth. I am worthy because I am. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and what's so powerful is it does not matter your past mistakes, what you've done wrong, your failures, the things that you've gone through. All, it, none of that matters. There is nothing you can do that deems you unworthy. You are worthy exactly, each and every person exactly as you are, mm -hmm. and it's innate. Now, self-confidence is so different than self-worth. Self-confidence, while it's an internal trait, it's based solely on so many things externally. So self-confidence fluctuates based on things like how you assess your, your skills and traits and competencies, right. how you might compare yourself to others, um, uh, how much of the measure of, of success you have uh, that the world tells you, mm -hmm. um, your willingness to try and go for it, right? And so self-confidence is the thing that we're taught from a, a young age matters. And, 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 and we're taught, you see every advertisement you see out there is telling us, you know, if you get this thing, then you'll be happy. If you yeah, that's right. work really, really hard, then you'll be happy. When you get to that thing, you've built a lot of self-confidence along the way, mm -hmm. but none of those things that we can achieve or win or uh, uh, you know, accomplish ever actually 
build self worth. They build self confidence, which is important. Which but is they so don't interesting. Build and th this is why this is so fascinating to me because you can see women. Actually, I was talking to a young uh, woman who's like one of my goddaughters, and she was saying that you know she'd gone back and gotten her master's degree, and she's feeling very good, and she's in the circles. But when she stands in the room, and there are people in the room who don't look like her, she doesn't feel worthy to be there. And I, I, I was like, I can't. I, I told her a friend of mine is writing a book, and it's called Worthy. Yes. And I'm gonna make sure you get one of the first copies because I said I don't even know how to address that because I, first of all, came up at a different time, and I never, ever, ever, ever felt that I didn't belong in a room, even though there was not another woman or another, you know, black person or brown person for you know, 500 miles, you know, in the distance. So I never had that, but I did have it with weight. Mm. And you say in Worthy that your weight does not determine your worthiness. Mm -hmm. So I felt that because I was overweight, because I didn't look like, as, as Maya used to say, I'm not built to suit a fashion model size, mm -hmm. but I'm a phenomenal woman. Uh, because I wasn't built, I wasn't what women on TV look like. That's where I, I, I was shamed by it. So don't wait on your weight to do anything is yes. one big thing. And, yes. and when it comes to, I have lost so much of my life waiting on, on my the weight, weight yes. right? To go to the thing, to say yes to the invitation, to do all that. But when it comes to weight and worthiness, this is, this is huge, Oprah. This is going to help so many people right now. I feel this. Uh, even in your journey... Of, of everything that you've shared publicly, right? When we hit these goals, like with weight, let's say, and, and maybe we gain weight or, or we lose weight, even in the moments when you've lost all of the weight, yeah. we can feel, and I'll, I'll actually ask you how you felt in that moment, uh, because so often, whether we get the big goal, we lose the weight, we hit the health goal, we we get married and have kids, We whatever it might be that we're striving for, once we arrive there, we might feel more confident, we might all those things, but you still take you with you. Your yeah. self-worth is still the same. That's right. You're right? the same person regardless of your size 10, your yes. size 14, your size 16, your yes. size 18, whatever it is, yes. you take you wherever you go. Yes, and so you can arrive and go, oh, I've lost 100 pounds, whatever it might be. And, and then it's exciting for a minute, maybe you feel more confident with different things, but your self-worth is still the same if you haven't built it. So it will always feel like something's missing, like it doesn't, it didn't solve all your life problems like you thought it would be. And then you keep doing more and more and more and more and you think you just didn't work hard enough, so you work for the next thing, whatever it might be, or you got to lose the weight again or whatever it is. Every single time you are only building confidence and you're getting a high often that's temporary. It feels like everything's amazing and you accomplish that goal. But when you haven't built strong self-worth, self-worth is like the foundation. Right. Confidence is like the house we build upon it. And we are only, the house is only ever strong. As, as the, the foundation. Yes, as, as the, the foundation. foundation. And so you arrive at the next goal and the next goal and the next goal going, why in my life? Do I feel like something's missing? Do I feel like this still isn't enough? And people will leave jobs because they think that's the reason they don't. They'll leave marriages because they just feel like something's missing and they don't realize they've gotten really good at building confidence and not good at, at and not even probably aware of, of their own self-value yes, and self-worth. Yes. So you say our perceived flaws can actually become our superpowers. For you, it was a skin condition. Mm -hmm. And tell us how that became your superpower. Yeah. So many of the things that we perceive as flaws or that are like the setbacks we're going through are, yeah. are really God setups yeah. for what we're called to do. And we just don't know it at the time. And it usually just sucks when you're going through it. And uh, so I have a skin condition. I love that. Setbacks are God setups. Yes. Setting you up. Yeah. Setting you up for the bounce, right? You're going to yes. bounce. Yeah. And you know what I love about like the hardest times we go through is once you've, you know, the thing you're going through now, it, it becomes a thing you've made it through. But then that thing you've made it through is literally the, I think, the biggest clue on how to tap into purpose because you're now able to help other people exactly. make it through. Exactly. And so one day, you know, uh, so I have a hereditary skin condition. 
uh, called rosacea. It gets very red and bumpy and uh, I've been to all the dermatologists, there's no cure. And uh, so I got very good at covering it up and one day I had no makeup on and I walked into a grocery store and I remember in the produce section, I made eye contact with another woman and she had a ton of hyperpigmentation uh, all around her, you know, all over her mm -hmm. face. And we just made eye contact for a moment, never said a word, both smiled at each other. And I felt in that moment, like, oh, wow, like we just saw each other. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and maybe my rosacea is not about me. Maybe it's something I actually need to show to help other people feel less alone and more enough. Maybe that's why I'm going through it. And the other thing that it helped me realize was in that moment when we really saw each other, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was like, this is a, a powerful feeling. Mm -hmm. And when I launched a cosmetics in my living room and it was years and years and years and years and years of no's and uh, a lot of experts saying, you know, women won't ever buy makeup from images that you're trying to show or, you know, cause I was showing real women, every age, shape, yeah. size, skin tone, skin challenge. And uh, and I just remembered what happened in that grocery store that day. And I'm like, I think people don't feel seen by the beauty industry. And when we got one big shot on QVC after years of hearing no's and we were teetering on bankruptcy, like they, all the third party consultants that I'd hired advised me, okay, if you got one shot, you need to go on national television to present your product and show women that have perfect, you know, flawless skin, all the same age, all this, like all the stuff. And yeah, I'm like- The things that advertisers do, yes. Yeah, and I just remember that moment in the grocery store and I knew, like I just had this knowing, even though so many other people had said no the whole time. And when I got my one big shot live on QVC, um, we sort of risked everything. And I made the decision to take my makeup off on national television and show my bright red bumpy rosacea. And I, you know, had real women as models, like every age, shape, size. And it was sort of like this huge risk where everything was on the line because if we didn't hit the sales goals in that 10 minute spot, the one shot I got on live TV, we wouldn't come back. And I just, by the way, I have to tell you this, <laughs> this is how powerful you already know that just the, I remember Maya telling you that your legacy is the life of every single person that you touch. Yeah. I keep that in mind with everything that I do. And I remember the week before my one big shot, not knowing if we're going to go bankrupt, not knowing, you know, should I, should I go on QVC and do what everyone else is doing? Like just teetering on that. And I sat in the parking lot, Oprah, for a week straight in this rental car all alone. I didn't know if I was going to lose my company. And I just sat there praying, crying. And then I remembered an episode you did where you sang I Surrender All. I and Surrender ran. All. Yes. So I was like, okay, this worked for Oprah. And so I literally sat in my car crying, singing I Surrender All, asking God to wow. take it from me because it felt so heavy. And I started to doubt myself. I started to be like, am I even worthy of being here on national television? Yeah, I just say to everybody, that's the key song. Whenever you've been in crisis and you've done everything you can do and you don't know what else to do, yes. you surrender all. Yes. And it generally turns out for the, not, not even generally, it always turns out for the best for you. Yeah. Because that's how the color purple came to me. That's when I was singing, I surrender all. Yes. I, exactly. Yes. And mm -hmm. I just, so thank you for that. <laughs> I sang that song and I knew, I knew what I had to do. And it's like, I've been getting all these no's, but God gives us a knowing. We can get no's from everyone else. We could tell ourselves no, and that's all of our self doubt in our own head. But when we get still, right? We can feel that kind of that voice, that intuition, that knowing. Yes. And I remember walking into the, the QVC building and I had on double Spanx because not because I cared how I looked. I was sweating so much <laughs> because I was like, I'm not nervous for television, but like everything was on the line and I made the decision to trust myself. I've heard of people wearing double Spanx. How do you get the second Spanx on top of the other Spanx? It's, I find it easier because I'm less sweaty to get the second one on. Oh my God. <laughs> I know. I was so nervous and um, there, there was this big 10 minute clock on the, on the floor and I learned Oprah that I thought, okay, you know, we, we paid to make all these, this product. We were only selling one to two orders a day on our website. We had to sell over 6,000 units of our product in a 10 minute window to hit their sales goal or not come back. And everything was on the line. And I remember the moment the big 10 minute clock started and it said on air and it was like 959, 958. 
And I learned right before I went on, you're not even guaranteed your 10 minutes. If you're not hitting numbers in real time, like you, you might think you have eight minutes left, but the clock jumps to one and you're done. And you know that you just lost everything. And so I was shaken like a leaf. Um, and in your double spanks. In my double spanks. And the, the clock started. And I remember I was trying to do this demonstration on my hand mm -hmm. to show that the, our product didn't crease like others. It's not going to crack. It's not going to make us look older. And I, I couldn't do it. My hand was like shaking. The host is like, thank you, sugar. And um, I remember the moment my bright red bare face before shot came up on national television. And I remember walking over to, to models every age and shape and size and, and skin tone, calling them beautiful and meaning it. And I, I remember we had about two minutes left. And I didn't know how we were doing, but I knew I wasn't cut yet. And, um, and literally there's, we got down to about 60 seconds and the host says, the deep shade's almost gone, the tan shade's almost sold out. And I was like, <gasps> and at the 10 minute mark, this giant sold out sign came up across the screen. And I start crying on national television and they cut from me and went to like Dyson vacuum or something. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I remember Paulo running through the double doors of the studio and he's, I thought he was gonna give me a hug and he's like, we're not going bankrupt. <laughs> and I, I was like sobbing. I'm like, real oh, women have spoken. <laughs> and um, that one shot of trusting myself, like the moments when we trust ourselves, our entire world changes and it's scary when a lot of other people are telling you to do something different or maybe you haven't had any success doing it your way yet, but you keep feeling in your gut like you're supposed to do it. And that one airing led to five that year and 101 the next year. And eventually we, we built the biggest uh, beauty brand in QVC's history, which is wild because they had actually said no, and you're not the right fit for us or our customers for a number of years. And so it was a big, um, a big moment. And so so yeah. you, you, you learned to handle rejection because yes. before that moment you'd had so much and you learned how to be resilient. And I know you want to talk today about the four steps. Mm. Uh, you call them the four R's, reveal, redefine, revisit, and revel. Let's talk about that. Yes. Oh my goodness. When you, you know, change your relationship with rejection and failure, this is every single person, um, you change your entire life. And especially when you've let rejection or failure take root in the form of your identity where you start to think you're a failure. And so many of us, you know, feel these things and the fear of rejection and failure kills more dreams than almost anything else. And a lot of people just associate so much pain with rejection. So this is life-changing. Okay, <laughs> I'm so excited to share this. So let me just ask everyone a question, right? Just... Right now, when you imagine yourself getting rejected or failing at something, for me, it's almost every day. A friend might mm -hmm. not invite you to coffee, whatever it is. Uh, when you imagine getting rejected or failing at something, what's the first thought you have to yourself, right? And for me, most of my life, it was, yep, there's proof I'm not enough. And I would think that without saying anything. Every time I got, you know, another rejection or another, and... For a lot of people, the first thought they have when they get rejected or they fail at something is, I'm not enough. I, I, you know, I'm not smart enough. I'm, you know, I'm not the right weight. I'm, I'm stupid. I'm a loser. I mean, the, the things that people write in, I yeah. mean, we have these thoughts. So for everyone listening and watching right now, whatever that thought you just had when you get rejected or fail, that is your current definition of rejection. That is your current definition of rejection. I just want everyone to take note of that for a second because every single thing in life is the meaning we attach to it. Mm -hmm. And when we change the meaning we attach, we change the story, we change our emotions around it, we change our life. And everything's the meaning to attach. So your current definition of rejection, for me, most of my life, oh yeah, I'm not enough. That's your current. When you were able to assign a new meaning. A meaning new, by redefining it. Yes, yeah. redefining rejection yeah. to a new meaning that has to be true. It has yes. to be powerful for you. It changes everything. And I'm going to give you a couple quick examples. Is, yeah. You know, building a cosmetics, getting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rejections. There were times where I was like so tempted to give up. And I remember one time in particular, I just started Googling all of my heroes and favorite thought leaders and people that have, you know, changed the world. And I'm like, oh, every single one of them has faced tons of rejections and failures. They're just the, the ones brave enough. They're the brave ones willing to keep going for it. Mm -hmm. 
And I made the decision midway through the years of rejection of building the company. I was like, okay, every time I get another no, and then we got a lot of no's, mm -hmm. I was like, instead of me going, yep, I'm not enough, I'm gonna intercept that and be like, nope, this is a reminder I'm one of the brave ones willing to go for it. Like, and I believe that true, yeah. it has to you're, be true. You're saying, this is gonna make me stronger, so I'm gonna yes. so bring it on. Yes, bring, bring it, it on. on, bring it on. And, and, and I really truly believe that to the point where every time a rejection or failure would happen, I believed it was a, almost a victory. Like I'm, a, I'm one of the brave ones willing to go for it. And I literally started embracing rejection and failure. It still hurts in the beginning, um, another another definition I use a lot is rejection is God's protection. Yeah. Um, so you redefine it. Yes, you redefine it. And number three is revisiting and reframing. And this is huge. Okay. So many of us believe our past failures, our past rejections, we let them take root and we think that's our identity. You can use this tool to revisit past rejections and literally transform them to the point where they don't impact your worthiness. So one example that is the one I use all the time, um, I will look back at people that maybe betrayed my trust or broke my heart mm -hmm. or a job that didn't see my value or someone, a friend that betrayed me. It could be anything you're going through. And I will revisit that and reframe it. And the most uh, common definition I use um, in case someone needs this one in their life today, is Oprah, I will look at that situation and I literally imagine my creator saying to me, oh, you weren't rejected. I hid your value from them because they're not assigned to your destiny. Mm. And I will apply that. And, and then over time, the way that, that you always say that things are, are happening for you, yeah, not to not you. Not to you. Right? And, I, and, and that's another powerful way to revisit things because when we look back over time, the dude we wanted it to work out so bad with, even though our friends are like, uh-uh. And later you're like, oh, thank goodness God hid my value from him because he is not assigned to my destiny. And I believe that with every job. Right. I believe Apollo that was. everything. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, so and, and then, you know, revel just means like, okay, you are one of the brave ones willing to go for it. Um, Oprah, I have a lot of issues I'm working on in my life, but fear of rejection and failure is not one of them. Like I am, I, I embrace it. And, and when I think of everyone listening and watching right now, if, if you imagine what would you do if you had no fear of rejection or failure in your life? Yep. Like, what would you do? That is powerful. So when you, when you start implementing these tools, it's just it can just transform every area. I love that you 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 actually used a quote from uh, Dr. Perry's and I our book that I co-authored with him. The book's called "What Happened to You." The line that you quote is that the lack of connectedness is an adversity, putting you at risk for physical and mental health problems. Why did that resonate with you so? Mm. We are in a day and age, you know how I shared that woman and I in the grocery store like saw each other, mm -hmm. right? We're in a day and age where we don't see anyone. I know. Right? And, and we don't see ourselves. Most importantly. Most importantly. And... I love sleepwalking. Yes, sleepwalking. Sleepwalking. And you know what's so powerful? Through life. And, and, and then we start to feel invisible and we feel unseen. And, and, you know, when you walk into a coffee shop, this is, or anywhere throughout your day today, if you just actually see one person and ask them how they are and listen and care, the odds are you're going to be the only person in that entire day. That is true. That sees them. Yeah. I, I know this to be so true. You're just validating what I learned in thousands and thousands of lessons on the Oprah show is that people used to say to me, why do people come on there and cry so much? Why do people like open up their lives and tell their stories? This is before reality television when now everybody does everything. Mm. But in the early days of the show, it was like really a, a, a big deal when somebody would get emotional or share a personal story. And I would always say it's because nobody's ever asked them before because mm -hmm. nobody's ever asked. And we know that, that most yeah. people never get truly asked, really, how are you? Yes. It's just a casual passing rhetorical thing. Yes. But most people are never really in um, intimate conversation yes. with people where somebody actually cares 
How are you? How are you? Yes. And you know, what I would say to what you just shared is, yes, we have reality TV, but I think there are so many people who are extroverts, who are doing all of this, but deep down inside, they're unseen. They're not sharing who Mm -hmm. they truly are. And we're in a day and age where people are confusing attention and achievement with worthiness. And they're so, so, so different. And I think being seen, and, and by the way, that when you actually, for anyone listening who feels unseen or invisible, the quickest way to feel seen is to literally see someone else. Someone else. Yes. When they, you're going to see a shift in their eyes. Like when you really see them, yeah. you'll tell in their iris of their eyes, they know they're seen. And in that moment, they see you. They see you back. Yeah. Like the incident with the woman in the store. Yes. yes. It's the most powerful, most powerful way to be seen. I thought this was so beautiful. You say on page 256 that we can trust what other people say about us. We can trust what our negative thoughts tell us about us, or we can trust what God and our soul says about us. Mm. How do you know which voice to trust? Yes. This is one of the, whether, no matter what you believe, you know, for everyone, everyone with us right now, whether it's in God or you practice a certain type of faith or the universe, this shortcut to Mm self-worth I have found to be the most powerful in my life. And, and here's what it is. If you are someone that has strong faith or says that you believe what you say you believe Mm -hmm. in my example, you know, I believe in God and, and I'm a Christian and, and yet my whole life, I know that God says I'm created, you know, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you are someone that struggles with self-doubt, but you also have faith, you cannot have both at the same time. If you say you believe God's word, Mm -hmm. but then you are doubting that you're enough and you have strong self-doubt, you're actually trusting your own thoughts and doubting God's word. Yeah. So, Sometimes people need to be reminded. Yes. Because recently you sent me a wonderful text to remind me. Yes. 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 Sometimes people need to be reminded. It's such a powerful, there there are so many people that believe strongly in their faith or their spiritual practice. And it's so easy to go, oh, wait a minute. The quickest hack, Oprah, is, you know, even before I walked in this room with you and my mind is tempted to doubt I'm enough and doubt I belong here. Like I instantly ask myself, who am I going to believe? My own thoughts or God's word? Or the fact that you're actually here. Or the fact that I'm actually here. <laughs> and when you, when you, when you, you know, when you silence your own self-doubt and, and cause you can't have both at the same time and you make that decision, who am I going to trust? Am I going to trust my creator and what he says about me? Or I'm going to trust my own self-doubt and it changes everything. You, you never doubt you belong in any room when you know who you're walking in with and you know who you are and you know whose you are. Yes. So, yeah. And Amaya used to have a, not used to have, she had a, has a phrase in one of her poems, it's called To Our Grandmothers. And the phrase that I love so much is, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Mm. And I cannot tell you how many meetings I've been in when there was not a soul in that room that looked like me or came from my background or, you know, listen, yeah, they, they, they were the big shots and I was not. Uh, I was the outsider, but I would literally s- s- steady myself and I would take a deep breath and I would say, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000 and I'm walking in for everyone who believed for me that this day could be possible. Yes. Yeah. So I, yes. wherever I go, I carry my ancestors with me and I carry the spirits of the, my, you know, my spiritual guides with me. I come as one. I stand as 10,000. That is my reminder. And I know that you uh, believe it's really important for people to embrace a concept you call, you're not crazy, you're just first. Yes. Whew. This was transformative for me when I, when I realized this. And for anyone who grew up thinking like, do I fit in? Um, am I, you know, why is no one else in my family uh, the way that I am or has thoughts like I do? Or for those of us that maybe feel misunderstood or like we have parts of us that are odd or quirky, um, you know, or you feel like you have to dim your light to make everyone around you comfortable. 
Um, you know, growing up, I remember feeling like I had these big dreams. I had a moment when I was um, growing up where I watched, I th thank God, caught this episode of Barbara Walters and you. And you said, I always knew I had greatness inside of me. Yeah. I was born for greatness. Born for greatness. Yes. And do you know so many people at the time criticized me for saying that, yes. but they, 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 I, I was so like uh, maligned because how dare I think I was born for greatness. I remember in Chicago, a lot of the, you know, critics and reporters, uh, you know, were slamming me saying, you know, how, you know, what she said that she was born for greatness. What? And even my bosses at the station that I was working said, you know, you need to be more humble. You don't, you shouldn't say that. And because nobody understood what I was talking about. No one they understood. Didn't, they didn't and, understand. And no one was understand. comfortable seeing a woman especially uh, know that she's worthy. Yes. Right? And, and still to this day, I want to talk about you're not crazy, you're just first, but still to this day, Oh my gosh, we still, the, the, the cartoons, the, everything tells us we're not enough on our own. We need, you know, we need uh, uh, a prince to come rescue us. That's or right. Our voice is gone until a, a prince kisses us and our voice comes back. Or, and then we grow up. As, I can't as, believe you were watching that. I just can't even believe you were watching that. <laughs> yes, day. Yes, yes. Yes, because when you said that, I felt the truth inside of me and I felt seen. And I was like, I feel that way too. And I didn't know how to put words to it, you know? And, and, and so, uh, and so growing up, you know, feeling like I was different and feeling like, okay, you know, I, I learned, I started dimming my light to make people around me comfortable and this and that. And, and, um, I'll fast forward a lot of things, but, uh, I was adopted and, and, and I have five families and no one in any of my families had ever gone to therapy. And in my late twenties, I, was you know about to get married before I thought I was ready. I was working overnights in television news, and it was the first time in my life I started having panic attacks and I went into depression. And you know, there's a lot of stuff that I've never shared before that I share in Worthy about um, things other people would call shameful that I had done and experienced growing up. And I was just having this crisis of like, who am I? And I remember um, asking, and so many people growing up would call me crazy. They're like, you're crazy. I'd have these big ideas. You're crazy. You're, you're odd. You're different. You're crazy. Mm -hmm. And I remember asking the therapist, like, am I crazy? And she's like, no, you're not crazy, but I'm really glad you're here. And she explained to me that so often when you're the first one in your family or your peer group or in the area you grew up in to think different or to want different, it can feel isolating and it can feel lonely and you can feel not enough. And when she was telling me all these things, I remember later just having this moment where I was like, I'm first, I'm first. And it was just like this uh, light bulb so hot, it burst. I, I remember the aha moment, as you would say, going, I'm not crazy, I'm just first. I'm not crazy, I'm just first. And it's this realization, and I talk a lot about this in Worthy, that so often the things we think, and this is for men, for women, for everybody, the things we think are odd or quirky or wrong with us are actually the things most right with us. Because there is only one of you in the entire universe. Isn't right? that just when you take that in? Yes. Isn't that miraculous? Miraculous. And there's never been, I mean, you have your own unique tongue print, fingerprint, iris. No one has the emotions and the experiences you do. So of course, even raised in the same home. Yes, yes. Yes. And if you are brave enough to show up in this world as you authentically are, there has never been a you before. There'll never be a you again. And so don't think there's something wrong with you if not everyone gets it. Like, you're not crazy. You're just first. You're the first only ever you. And so many of us, we want to belong so bad that we start dimming our light. We change who we are and we feel lonelier than ever because you cannot have an authentic relationship unless you actually show up as who you truly are. And so this idea of you're not crazy. That's what Worthy is all about. Yes. You cannot have an authentic relationship with yourself or anyone else unless you're willing to show up as who you really are. Yes. That's what Worthy and How to Believe You Are and Transform Your Life is really all about. So let's us close. Can you believe that listen, <laughs> our time is done? You must end with this poem. Okay. okay. So this is, so Worthy is 
packed. There's over 20 tools on how to build self-worth, and there's one poem. And, and there's one poem. One poem. And this is an excerpt from that poem okay. uh, called, You're Not Crazy, You're Just First. Who do you think you are, they say. Things like that aren't for people like us. Why are you going around changing, planning to leave us in the dust? Are you forgetting where you come from? Is it not good enough anymore? And just like that, the temptation to play life small feels more comfortable than before. They call you odd, strange, different for having dreams bigger than they can see. Because those dreams weren't given to them, they see them through fear and anxiety. And even the well-intentioned people who love you to the bone can see you pursuing your dreams as a reflection of them not fulfilling their own. Yep. If people like people who are like them, hiding who you are can feel like home. But a calling unexpressed inside of you leaves you feeling anguished and alone, even inside of your own home. They call you words like crazy and say we stick together for better or for worse, but what your soul knows is you're not crazy, you're just first. The first to launch the business, to dust your dreams off of the shelf, the first to believe you're worthy of betting on yourself, the first to beat addiction, to live life sober and awake, the first to break the generational cycle that you know you're born to break, the first to start healing, the first to forgive so you'll be free. The first to love others for who they are, not for who you wish they'd be. The first to be a visionary, to dream up the screenplay that you'll write. The first to recognize your gifts and stop hiding in plain sight. The first boss in your company to say, I deal with self-doubt too. The first mom to say, no, I'm not okay and I don't know what to do. The first in generations to love your body and celebrate it joyfully to prove it, to know that it's a miracle in motion and what a gift it is to move it. The first to risk rejection, to speak your truth with vigor, knowing that the opposition might be big, but your creator is bigger. The first to cheer yourself on and truly believe it not just fake it, knowing that most people won't cheer you on until after you make it. The first to stand up for the outcast and say, stop teasing, I just won't. You might be tempted to underestimate me, but let me save you some time. Don't. The first to say, yeah, you hurt me, but I'm not rejected, see? God just hid my value from you because you're not assigned to my destiny. The first to believe in your dreams, even when others might not get you, and then one day love them anyways when they're bragging to people how they met you. <laughs> See, when we fear we're not enough and fear even more we won't be loved, it's so tempting to shrink in size and trade in our purpose for their hugs. But when you're feeling like you don't fit in or that you never quite belong, your uniqueness is your superpower. Your truth is never wrong. And when they criticize to hold you back because your dreams aren't what they're used to and they're afraid that you'll outgrow them, leave them behind and that they'll lose you, stop asking for their advice if they've never been there themselves. Because when you people please for others, you end up betraying yourself. So when doubt tempts you to dim your light, Always remember this verse. Your soul knows you were made for more with so much purpose it could burst. You're born with greatness inside of you. And whether it's a blessing or a curse, the world won't be better until your greatness is dispersed. See, there's only one of you in the entire universe. And your knowing knows you're not crazy. You're, you're just, just first. <laughs> That is fantastic. Jamie's book, Worthy, How to Believe You Are Enough and Transform Your Life, is available now wherever books are sold. Um, get it for yourself and get it for anybody else you know who needs to know they are worthy. Thanks.